So please, put everything away except a pencil. That's right. Of course I'm serious. Of course I'm serious. Yay. What set did you work with? What was it? ETV with analysis. Conclusions. Observations. Who has a conclusion or an observation they would like to share? Justin. Um, I first I draw a graph for just. To, uh, Don't need to explain. I just want to know what your conclusion or observation um, was. Because of the global warming, the the temperature that up increases the, the speed of increasing temperature and decreasing temperature in nineteen in two thousand and ten is much faster than eight and um, than. The rate of change of temperature is faster in 2010 than it was in 1892. Yeah. The rate of change of temperature change is faster in 2010 than it was in 1892. Okay. Can someone be uh, more specific? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that um, in the next 10 years, uh, I really think temperatures will go down. Um, the average daily temperatures, the average yearly, the average yearly temps will drop, okay? Okay? Victor, what do you think? What's your prediction? I saw that it is too hard for the graph to reach points that are too far away from the... I'm sorry, what? Like, there are some points that go too far away from the graph. There are outliers, you mean? Yeah. There are points that are harder to model? Yeah. There are data points that don't seem to fit the overall model too well. What are those called? Outliers. Outliers. So another observation, yeah, Covert, what'd you come up with? Um, well, temperatures in like um, January and December are more really September have a few significant. So Jan, Feb temps are varied, but September what? In September, or, or uh, another month, September, but September uh, was pretty constant. Anything else you noticed? <laughs> Hanley? Um, it's six years in a row without having an annual temperature lower than 25. And what years? Start since 2004. So since 2004, yeah? I've never had a temperature lower than 25. And what temperature? The annual average, you mean? Since 2004, the annual average has never been below 45. And yep. Yep. We reached that's yeah the highest ever average yearly temps. Is that true? No. In, in 98, it was 48.3. In 2010, it was 48. So it's not actually okay. Another observation, Macy. Um, that while the overall annual data is trending higher, um, you find that the average temperature for the last year is higher than the temperature. So overall data is trending higher, but the a you need to be more specific. The average temperature in, like in where? January, February, March, April, and 2000 for like 2010 and 1900, like overlap. Just for those months. Or for the whole year, so but the average but the average monthly temps in 1900 and when are the same? Are very close. What was the average yearly temp in 2000 and 1900? What? 47.1. 2010. What was it? 48. I understand, but overall, though, it, overall, there's a 0.9 degree difference. So that brings up the question, is that a big change, small change? That's a very big point of contention. To some people, that is an enormous change. To some people, that's like, yeah, whatever. But you're right. Seemingly, numerically, it doesn't look like that much. Everything's relative, right? When we think of hot and cold, we think of minus 40 and 140, right? That's what we think of as hot and cold. Okay. Any other observations or conclusions? Uh, Linos and Linos and Bipis, Yeah. Although the temperatures in the months varied for the past hundred years, yeah. the average temperature was relatively the same. 
Okay, so average temp seems to be about the same. Yeah. Do people agree with that conclusion? No. Who agrees that the average temperature seemed to be about the same over the past eight since 1892? <laughs> Who thinks they don't stay about the same? They think so. What do you think? Do they go up or down generally? What do you think? Trending up or down? Well, Trending up uh, or down or scattered? Yeah, I, I plotted it. I plotted it, yeah. and it went like this. I understand, but you're, you you said it stays the same. I said stays the same. Stays the same means this. I I know. I said relatively the same. Okay, but so we need to be very specific okay. about our wording, right? It's um, it's fairly scattered with no trend. Oscillating up and down with seemingly no trend. Anything else? Anything else specific? Yeah. Um, I think it would have been. Have, yeah. 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 There we go. There's something that's concrete. January is the coldest month. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. Do you have numeric data? How did you How did you come to that conclusion? Averages for January, February, and January is lower. Except if you're in the Middle East. Yes. Well, he's saying overall, though. He said he averaged out all of them. He's making a more general statement overall. And let's go. Any other any other observations? Yeah. And then Magoon. July is usually the highest temperature in the year. Okay. What else? And what did you, Magoon, did you come up with one? I was going to say that one. That one? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so it, what did you, <laughs> um, what did you learn about the modeling process? It takes a long. It takes a, it takes a long time. What else? Uh, yes, yeah, Dan. Um, personally. Yeah. Yeah, can be tough to use. Yep, takes practice. Absolutely. What else? Yeah. Um, it. You should go deep to find conclusions. Yeah. Be careful. So what do you have to be careful of? Be careful of surface judging. Yeah. <laughs> judging, I'll call it that. Yeah. Anything else? What else did you learn? I'll, I'll add this in my own thing. It's really hard to come up with a right answer. They're both right or... Popu and I'll, I'll add one more thing. Popular beliefs are frequently dead wrong. Do you understand what I mean? A lot of people might believe that something is the way it is because of something, and there's either absolutely no correlation or it might have the exact opposite effect. Okay, we're going to pause there. So, rational functions. What questions do people have? So, let's have someone let's give one question. One, yeah, go. Uh, will so will there always be intercepts? Yeah. Good question. Next question, yeah. Um, what if the numerator is a polynomial function with degree with three or five? What uh, happens five. when you and run you into a uh, numerator three. with degree three or higher? Yeah. What happens? Yeah. I'll, okay. Well, I'm not answering these questions yet. I'm just get, collecting the questions. I like that. Another question. Another question. Yeah. Uh, why is it when the uh, I forget what it's called, yep. the b squared minus four ac? Yeah. Uh, why is that when that's less than zero? zero. Yep. Two imaginary. Ah. Dimensions? Why does a negative discriminant result in two imaginary solutions? Good. Good question. I like that. Any other questions that came up? Yeah. <laughs> What's a Paul? That's fine. I was a I was wondering because I'd imagine you're not the only one. You're not the only one that's gonna ask that or should ask that. And make uh, Macy. Um, what happens if you do have yeah. What happens when a function crosses the x-axis? Okay. Any other specific questions? Any other ones? Yeah. Oh, in in my what what's the diff? Are you talking about the numerator and denominator or the two examples I gave? 
be, so what's the what's the difference between rational functions? Okay. Let's do one more. One more good question. There's one more good one. Yeah. Uh, if if the function is neither symmetric over y axis or nor the origin. Yeah. Okay. These are great questions. I really like this. This is fantastic. Okay. So let's do these. I'll, I'll try to knock off some of the easy ones. Will there always be intercepts? No. Uh, at most, how many y-intercepts can there be? What happens if there's more than one? It's not a function. Bingo. Um, how many x-intercepts can you have? Yeah, in math, there's three numbers of answers. There's either zero answers, one answer, or many. And when I say many, I mean infinite. The really interesting math questions that I've run across are where you arbitrarily end up with something like, there's only seven answers. I always love it when random numbers pop up in arbitrary situations. I love that. Um, you, you can have as many x-intercepts as you want. Absolutely. Um, now here, we're not, I'm going to answer this. Um, anybody, can anybody answer this question? What happens when you run into, into numerators with degree 3 or higher? What happens to the whole process? The process becomes more fun. This is what we're going to be focusing on. Focusing lots of our time on this. Right now you know how to factor, you know how to work with quadratics and below. I'm going to teach you how to deal with three, four, five, polynomials of higher degree than two. I showed you one trick. Are there many tricks? But that, that trick I showed you in this video only works with that only a limited number of 4 theory polynomials. It doesn't work with all of them. It only works with some of them. <laughs> so there are many tricks. What happens, so my question to you is, what happens when we start dealing with higher degree polynomials? It becomes more fun. It becomes more fun. It becomes more complicated. There's a lot more to do. Overall, are we looking for the same types of things? Yes. We're looking for intercepts, zeros. Do we have to learn more techniques? Yes. Absolutely. Why does a negative discriminant result in two imaginary solutions? Can anybody explain that to me? Why? If the discriminant is less than zero, the number underneath the root in the quadratic equation, yes, is less than zero, meaning the quad out the quadratic of the quadratic equation QE pumps out two imaginary results. So if the discriminant is less than zero, you're taking the square root of a negative number, which results in two imaginary numbers. Can we graph imaginary numbers on the real number line? No, you can't. So that's why it results in. If What happens if the discriminant is zero? What type of answer do you have? Only one. One real. And if it's greater than zero, you have two real. Two real. What's a polynomial? Ready? I'm going to answer it this way. Look it up. Not answering it. We've already discussed it. It's all over the place. You've talked about them. Essentially, every function you have ever looked at, ever, pretty much, is a polynomial. Logarithms are polynomials. Certain exponential, exponential functions aren't, but many of the functions you've looked at are polynomials. What happens when a function cr uh, crosses the x-axis? Uh. It does. <laughs> um, the numerator is 0 there. How do you make a fraction equal to 0? What's the only way to make a fraction equal 0? The numerator is 0. So a function crosses the x-axis when the numerator is 0. zero. What's the difference between rational functions? So if you have two rational functions, they are different. What can be different? Just about anything. They can look really weird. They can look really weird. And if there's no symmetry? Yep, no symmetry. What's helpful? You're trying to see what would be helpful. It's nice when there was what? Is symmetry. <laughs> if there is, it helps you draw the picture. Because if you know something is symmetric across the y-axis and you have one half of it, you automatically have the other half. If you know it's symmetric over the origin, if you have one quadrant, you already have the other quadrant. If you have one, you have four. If two, you have, four. If you have one, you have three. And if you have two, you have four. Great. But if there's no symmetry, you're like, great, there's no symmetry. Nice. Okay, so I have a handout for you. Very simple starting point. D I S. D represents domain. domain. I represents how many kinds are there? Uh, 
Two. Two. Line X. Two. What does S represent? We're going to start here. We're going to start here. So let's look at R1. Let's look at R1. The domain. How do you go about finding? Someone raise their hand and tell me how do you go about finding the domain of R1? Denise. And then what? Buy it. Buy the flower. What do you do next? Exactly. So do that for me. Do that for R1. Tell me, tell me what the domain of R1 is. Tell me what the domain Keep it to yourself. You can write on the sheet. It's yours if you want. Okay, can someone tell me what you need to solve in order to find the domain of this? What are you solving? Tell me, uh, Baldwin, what equation are you solving? And what's the nice way you can go about solving this? What should you do? Factor. Ah, is this nicely factorable? Yeah. Yeah, x plus 4 times? Minus 3. Equals? Zero. So x is equal to negative 4 or 3. Can someone tell me what the domain is? Someone raise their hand. Someone who hasn't spoken yet today. Someone new. Someone new. Someone new who hasn't spoken today. Someone who hasn't. Everybody's here. Bruckner, what is it? Um, x plus 4. Yep. X does not equal what? It does not equal 3. Yep, absolutely. So there's your domain. Nice. Ex awesome. Okay. So let's go back up and look at this equation again. So here's our equation. What's next? We found the domain, so now we need to find the intercepts. What's the, easy, what's the easiest type of intercept to find, if there is one? Y. The y-intercept is when? When x equals zero. Exactly. When x is zero. Fantastic. So, can someone just look at that and tell me what the y-intercept is when x is zero? What's y? Uh, zero. Plug in zero, what does the top become? Zero. What's the denominator become? Zero. No. No, negative 12. Zero over negative 12 is? Zero. So the only y-intercept is? Zero. zero, zero. That's also a? It's also an x-intercept. So I want you to take a minute and tell me what the x-intercepts are, if there are any. Tell me what did you need to do? Factor the so you have 3x squared minus 3x, and you're setting that equal to? Zero. And you want to, oh, look, it is factorable. What can you, someone raise their hand. What can I factor out? What should I factor out? Victor, what should I factor out? 3x times what? Yeah. So x is equal to 0 or? 1. 0 or 1. So when x is 0, y is 0. And when x is 1, y is? Zero. Did you already find one of them? Yep. So we actually have two intercepts right here. So we have two intercepts. We know where it crosses the x-axis. We know um, not much else. So what's step three? Symmetry. Symmetry. What do we plug in? Let's do R1 of negative x. So we end up with 3 negative x squared. This is all pretty familiar, right? Just by looking at it, what can you tell me? Um, that doesn't change. That changes. This changes. That. And what happens? Does that equal the original function? No. Does it equal the opposite of the original function? No. It does not equal r1 of x, and it does not equal negative r1 of x, so this is? Neither. So that's what you have so far. All you know about this function so far is you have the y-intercept, you have the x-intercept, and you know it's not even and it's not odd. Do we know anything else yet? Not yet. Are we going to learn how to find more about it? Yeah. Absolutely. So the first part of your homework tonight, uh, complete steps D, I, S on... R2, R3, and R4. That's the first part of your homework tonight. This is on the handout. On the handout. Okay, ready to have some fun? You have the data that you have. So much fun. So much fun. Your homework. You're going to finish the bean counting lab the, with the data you have. So the back, the questions are on the back. Questions are on the back. Finish that. Also, you're going to watch Rational Functions Part 2 and come in with at least two questions. So that means you're doing those three, the three analysis uh, questions 
uh, R1, R2, R2, so R2, R3, R4, you're going to complete steps DIS. You're going to continue the bean counting lab and watch Rational Functions Part 2.